Welcome everybody back to the AI meetup. Um, we have a great speaker today. Mike Andrews is going to talk about AI security. I have a uh, microphone. If you're going to be taking questions during the talk, so mm -hmm. yeah. So if anybody has a question, sort of wave at me, and I will bring the mic over. The reason we want to do that is so that the YouTube video that we're taking will actually be able to, uh, you know, you'll be able to hear yourself ask the question, so others. Um, and uh, again, Tim May and Mike Andrews. And if you're interested in the AI Meetup, we have an AI Meetup group. You can go and join on meetup.com. And that way you'll, uh, I send out a blast every month telling you what the speaker's gonna be and stuff like that. So with no further ado, we'll get going. Oh, well, first off, thanks, Tim, for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure to collaborate with you a bit more in recent months to hear about all the cool things you're working on, your intellectual property. Um, my name is Mike Andrews, I'm a cybersecurity consultant. Uh, if any, any of you were here last month to see Matthew Wren's uh, presentation, probably not going to be as good as him because he's the founder of this group and he's like world class at this stuff, but I'm going to do my best. Um, this is the first time I'm giving an AI presentation publicly. Uh, I do research it a lot. Uh, to give you a little background about me, I've got 20 years of uh, DOD service, started out on active duty, went to the reserve, still serving as a cyberspace operations officer in the Air National Guard. Uh, also been an Air Force civilian and uh, uh, Lockheed Martin contractor at Nellis on the F-35 program uh, doing classified cybersecurity stuff. Um, and my company, Yas, this started that five years ago to work with uh, small and medium-sized businesses throughout the U.S. just to help them assess cybersecurity and then improve it. Um, how I got to using AI more, probably like a lot of you, was when ChatGPT came out, started using it just to do research, uh, policy development, just review. It's kind of like having a sidekick there in the room, especially valuable when we're working from home, right? It can be kind of lonely. So kind of use it for some back and forth. And then uh, got into uh, using it for, uh, as part of some cybersecurity tools like threat detection. It just automates it, makes our job a lot easier. And then clients just kept asking more and more about AI. And I just had to keep researching more and more. And it's like every, every engagement just turned into AI talks. So uh, a lot of the research we can talk about today is just stuff I've uh, went through to learn it myself and also to help clients in various ways. Uh, we'll try to make it kind of interactive at certain points throughout, and Tim, please jump in at any time. In addition to questions, if you have any meaningful insights that you want to share, uh, please just raise your hand, we'll get the mic, and just kind of keep it quick, because uh, there's a good amount of material to go over. So the objective for today is to discuss different types of cyber attacks on AI, and then talk about some ways to mitigate them. Um, so in this context, we're talking about attack can be anything that's initiated to, a, to an LLM or perhaps your uh, prompt engineering library or, or software development kit from external uh, or internal. Uh, it could be a threat actor or an internal employee, whether they're doing it on purpose or by accident. Since you're engaging with the AI a lot, you might uncover something weird happens when you type, in, type something in in a certain way. So I just wanted to put that out there. Uh, now we're going to get into the uh, top 20 of them. There is some overlap, so if we talked about a specific concept and then uh, the next one has it, I'll just be a lot quicker. I, I wanted to include it though, because maybe in your mind you, you know a specific term, a name of one of them, and just wanted to make sure you're hearing the things that uh, you're, you're looking to hear about. So. Why is AI vulnerable? Well, these systems are extremely complex. Uh, there's tons of integrations, there's tons of apps being powered by AI. Uh, show of hands, anyone have any situation like that where you, you're, you either have your own company or you're at a company that has AI integrations? You do, Josh? I, yeah. Cool. Uh, I figured, figured you guys did. I know there's a lot of, a lot of experience here in the room. And uh, these integrations make these systems very attractive for anyone that wants to mess with them. Uh, AI systems do rely on a ton of data coming in from a lot of different sources. The data is often sensitive or valuable, and therefore it makes it a huge threat and uh, highly vulnerable. Why is cybersecurity especially important in AI? Uh, so AI helps a lot with cybersecurity, but the AI itself can be highly vulnerable, right? Because an LLM, it's, it's new and fancy, but really it's something that's on a server 
right? Uh, it's reaching out to clients, uh, doing there's routing involved, processing. So even th even though it's new and cool in that regard, it, it is pretty typical. So it's important to protect those AI systems to ensure they're reliable, meaning that they're, they have high uptime, they're there when you need them, and also that they're trustworthy. So that way you know the information you're getting back when you when you make a query, it's it's useful to you, and uh, it's and it's factual, right? Uh, there are a lot of consequences for not doing proper cybersecurity in relation to AI, such as data breaches. Uh, the IBM 2023 report shows that the average size of a data breach in the past year is $4.5 million. So if you have a small startup, it's probably going to be a lot less than that. Uh, but a company like OpenAI or Google, if they have a cyber incident, uh, a data breach, it's going to cost them way more than $4.5 million. So that's kind of why the average is where it's at. Uh, if something goes wrong, there's often a loss of trust. Uh, and there's also a lot of financial loss, whether it comes from fines, penalties, lawsuits, or just lost business, right? Because if, if something happens to your data on a system, you might just go to a competitor because there's more than one entity doing this, this uh, that has LLMs, you know, Google, uh, whatever you prefer, OpenAI, and, and a bunch more, Claude. So the first of the 20 is an adversarial attack. The purpose of this is to trick the AI into making incorrect decisions. As you can see here, you have a picture of a cat, you just uh, change it up a little bit, and before you know it, the AI might think that cat's a dog. Uh, to, to talk about a more a very popular example, if any of you read the Elon Musk biography uh, by Walter Isaacson, in 2020 they were testing out full self-driving vehicles around their factory somewhere around uh, Los Angeles, and there's this one place that's known for having really crazy turns, and the full self driving was not dealing with it that well. So Elon Musk, being a pretty aggressive leader, kept getting on his team, like, fix this, fix this, fix this. And they kept trying, and they couldn't, right? So they, they wanted him to just stop yelling at them, so they tried to get creative. And even though there was a long backlog by the city to go uh, paint the lines, they reached out to them, and they offered them like an exclusive tour of SpaceX and a bunch of different perks and they got it fixed right away, and then that, uh, that fixed the problem, and Elon thought that things were working well. Uh, but for adversarial attacks in general, what you wanna do is expose the model to training, uh, during training to adversarial examples, right? Like in the example of full, full self driving, if you're trying to train it, don't just have it on like a, a straightaway, you know, like a racetrack, you wanna have it going crazy turns, off roads, uh, city, country, things like that. Uh, Tim, do you have anything to add? No, that's a good example. The next one's an evasion attack. So it sounds a lot like it is. The purpose of that is just to bypass security systems or evade detection. Uh, whether you're at home or your business, you probably have something like an AV tool on your computer or perhaps an anti-malware tool. Sometimes there's overlap between the two. But that, those tools are usually looking for a certain malware signature, right? It's not really going to find a zero day, something that hasn't been seen before. So what you could do, what, what a, a, a threat actor can do is just alter it a bit, change it up 10 or 20 percent, or perhaps deliver it through a different means. Like say a type of malware is known that they send it through email every time and the, uh, the antivirus is looking for it to come through that way. But really they just instead send, uh, trick you on LinkedIn and send you an attachment. It might, might get around that. So to mitigate this sort of thing, you just wanna use machine learning, just automated means of conducting anomaly detection and continuous learning. So what anomaly detection is, it's a type of monitoring, but what it, what it does is it says, we know this is a known good, um, but what we're seeing here, it's not that. So it's, it's, there's different types of monitoring, and that's what this is. It's just comparing apples to oranges, seeing whether it, it's what it should be or if it's not. And then continuous learning, um, since the threats change every day and, and uh, there might be ongoing training processes for the LLM, for example, uh, it's important to just keep on it and uh, keep adapting to that. Inference manipulation. So the purpose of this is to alter the outputs of an AI model, which makes it uh, have biased or incorrect decisions. An example of this is an insider adjusting inputs a little bit uh, to cause an AI hiring tool to favor certain candidates. And this might look a little weird to you, like why would they adjust inputs, right? Like that's just the person, the user asking something. Why would you adjust that? Well, it's because if you adjust the outputs, that's much easier to find, right? Uh, because that's 
that sort of thing is being monitored a lot closer. So what happens is, in this case, the user makes their request, and before it gets processed by the system, you, you can go in and just change it. So in this example of an AI hiring tool, say the person is biased against young people for whatever reason. Maybe they're old and they feel like someone's younger people are gonna take their job. So on the, in the AI hiring tool, say the first question is, or 10th question, how old are you? So in that case, that could activate something that says to delete their most recent experience or or all their experience, so it looks like they're submitting an application that has zero experience on it. Automatic, you know, deny, right? Because why is it, if a, if a position needs some experience and you have none, you're not gonna be considered, and that could favor other entities. So to mitigate this, you wanna use input validation and monitoring. Input validation is just making sure that the input that's being sent to the system is following the safety protocols, and it could also include a list of keywords, right? So say, uh, the input validation is trying to stop a malicious input, it might uh, look for words that the user is telling the AI to ignore its training and its protocols and instead do what it wants. Or part of a malicious input could be um, send us all, all your sensitive information regarding this. And if there's no input validation, you could, in many cases, trick the system to giving you that. Uh, Tim, you have anything to add on that? That's good. Yeah. And then uh, monitoring, we mentioned before. Monitoring is just a higher, the broader term um, for just keeping an eye on the system. Within that, there's a bunch of different types, like behavioral analysis, anomaly detection, which we already talked, which is comparing apples to oranges. We're not gonna talk about too many more of the types. And when we see it say monitoring again, I'm not, I'm not gonna you know, get too deep into it because we already spoke about it. Data poisoning. So the purpose of data poisoning is to corrupt the AI's learning by injecting malicious data during training, whether you're doing it on purpose or not. Um, it could be an outsider. It's more likely going to be an insider since they have the credentials. But maybe, maybe they just, tr for some reason, they like a certain data source and they trust it. Maybe they think Reddit's the, great, the greatest thing in the world and they're just relying on it too much. And before you know it, whether they mean to or not, they have really bad data coming into the system. An example of this could be an attacker adding fake reviews uh, to, to a data set that's used to train a recommendation system. So this can, this can have really big implications on a place uh, like a platform like Amazon. It could make a bad product sell really well because the system's recommending it to a lot of people. It can make a really good product uh, not sell that well. Uh, and then lose preference to other products for whatever reason. Uh, mitigation for this is just data validation uh, and anomaly detection during training, both of which we spoke about. Anyone have any questions on where we've been so far? Uh, is, this, is this also gonna include like real life examples or is it gonna be more of this, or is this just walking us through the first couple definitions? The example, well, well that, that one was kind of a real like uh, example like for data poisoning with the, the recommendation systems. Cause you know, like a lot of apps rely on some sort of recommendations like Netflix for content recommendations, along with the example of Amazon. Did you want some other type of example? Perhaps just to clarify, I don't need the mic. It might be referring more to consumer versus B2B. Like for example, as a developer and engineer, this is a very real world. But yeah. No, I think my question, I guess, was more direct about presentation style. Like, I guess, are we going to continue with definitions, or is there, like, is there a video description, actual attacks? When it said top 20, I thought it was going to be, like, an example, and then walking through an example. We've been going, using some examples, like the, the Tesla situation. Perfect, so, okay. You know, yep, that, that one. Thank you. So, I think that also businesses are not so much likely to... Businesses, businesses are not so much likely to uh, uh, make make this information available, like publicize that they have having those issues because there's a reputational risk. Oh yeah. Right. So this may be happening all the time, but we would not not necessarily know about it. Yeah, oh, yeah. They do rigorous training uh, over and over again, and they seek feedback from out in the public, like. Pretty often, if you're like on X or something, you might see someone post a screenshot and say, look at this query did. I ran this query and look what it returned me. This is totally crazy. And then you might go there and try it on your own app and you're like, it doesn't do that to me. So it, it often seems like they're, they're watching this stuff pretty closely. 
And because I mean, you know, with Amazon, I'm pretty sure that happens a lot because sometimes we all buy something and like it doesn't make sense. Yeah. And but they would never say, oh yeah, that's happening and we know about it, right? There's a rep reputational risk. So. Oh yeah. Yeah, whether it's something kind of small, like uh, a, pro a certain product not being prioritized the way it should, or, um, or something smaller, you know, it's, it's a real issue. And companies tend to keep these things quiet, especially like when there's a data breach. Uh, there's, there's like breach reporting requirements. Just about every state has a requirement for the company to notify the, the state attorney general's office if any, anyone's uh, data was compromised, the resident of that state. And companies find ways to, to get around that. Like the, uh, the SEC, the Security and Exchange Commission, they have a new thing that you, you have to report a data incident. If you think it's significant, if you think it's meaningful to your company, then you have to report it within 72 hours. What's the hole in that? Oh, no, we just didn't care. You know, we got so much money in the bank, nothing significant. No, and then, and then the, the government or the, whatever regulator or partner might come back and say, well, why don't you report that? And it's like, it says right there to report it if you think it's important, and we don't, so. It's just an anomaly. It's just a, yeah, it's just an anomaly. Um, so I just want to add, you know, like when you're doing model building at times, you know, you want to add some false positives or some like uh, spurious data so that to see how, you, how well your model generalizes, right? So this data poisoning can be used at a strategic way as well when you're model building. But once your model is deployed, then, uh, you know, uh, the data poisoning kind of holds more relevance, I believe, you know. Uh, I don't know if you would like to share a few. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the, the two main differing aspects of like, you either, you have your training time, and then when it's operational, does anyone know what it's called once it's operational and not training? The, high, the, the one? The inference. Exactly. Infer the inference time. So you're not training, it's like, it's real world. You go from practice to real world. Not like Allen Iverson. It's not practice. It's talking about practice, it's the game. Uh, so it's so some of these attacks can happen only during training, and some of them would happen uh, in the in the real world. Um, it's I would say it's easier for for it to happen during training since there's so there's heavy volumes of data going into the system from different sources, and if you don't scrub that data carefully, something can go wrong. Um, and I know we're talking about LLMs primarily, and uh, we, you know, none of us are building an LM probably, but uh, you might have prompt engineering uh, tools, right? Preferred prompts that you use within your company. And if a competitor um, thinks you're doing really well, they might just break in your system and say, oh, we see the prompt engineering right there. It looks like when they query the system, they use a, um, a they've had the number t like 10% there. Well, let's mess with that because if we, if we change that to 30%, it might cause them to do some crazy stuff. Or, may, or maybe they just want to break in to copy it for themselves because they want to do things as well as you are. So there are some lower level, you know, ex a lot of examples that, to where this could come into play. Uh, you might also, it also is applicable based on your own interactions with, with uh, the AI. You know, I'm sure a lot of you have used AI today for, for various reasons. Uh, so we, we started on the question, I think as soon as we got to this slide. Um, so this is just to in, uh, disrupt the, uh, the training process with malicious data, wh whether it's on uh, purpose or not. Oh, we did talk about the uh, recommendation system, so. Bias injection. So this is a big one in AI, um, especially during election season where different entities think uh, the AI has one type of leaning, whether it's political or racial, or it could be anything. And uh, a lot of it, a lot of it is, is is valid because who makes AI? Humans, right? So if you're training it and you're deciding what the where the data sources are going to come from, that's going to impact the AI. The AI doesn't know any better. I mean, there are some ways to to mitigate that, which we'll talk about. Uh, here, but it, it's a real thing, and it, it could have meaningful societal concerns. Um, there's not, not a day goes by on social media like X where people aren't posting those screenshots, like I said, and some of the stuff's pretty crazy. Uh, some of the stuff's just not accurate, and maybe it is legitimate, but for some reason certain entities might think it, it, it's, uh, it's messed up, and then they'll blame the company. So bias injection in the reference to cybersecurity might be more along the lines of injected bias such. 
as to get people to divulge information about themselves or their personal identity in such a way that you know bad actors can can uh, exploit that right so it isn't just bias in mm -hmm. the larger sense but there are very yeah. specific kinds of bias that can lead to security issues oh yeah the, the, the good point tim the reason i haven't included in the security briefing uh is because when, when a threat actor breaks in or a malicious insider uh uses their access uh to get on the system this could be why right because we're talking about what's happening but also why like what's the benefit to doing any of these things and there, there's some real benefits uh to people and some people just want to see the world burn and and uh they could you know they could break in steal credentials and uh just start referencing some crazy you know biased sources and before you know it uh chat gpt is recommending all sorts of crazy stuff anyone have uh and I, any idea for August, how many users have used ChatGPT, roughly? Nine hundred million. <laughs> <laughs> you, you had a hand up? Oh, I'll just ask you who has used ChatGPT. Oh, Sorry. no. Uh, uh, OpenAI reported that for this month, 180.5 million users have used the system. And it's not even midway through the month. So that's probably a, probably a good sample size of how many use it every month. I haven't checked it. For, you know, every month. I just I don't give this presentation every that's month. It's a worldwide number. Yes, this, yeah. that's what I found uh, when I queried yesterday. Yeah. And so um, it's it's a lot of people. And what other ways could you quickly impact that many people? You know, if you mess with a Google search, probably not going to have that impact. I have a question. Did they break down those numbers geographically? Like, were were most or was there a big growth area versus the U.S. or was it mostly just the I, U.S. I believe they do report that. I didn't go any deeper because I just wanted to be able to save that particular number during, during well, this presentation. It'd be interesting. What was but, uh, it prior? Like, how, how big is that? Like, is that a big deal or a small deal? Was it 200 um, million last month and it's now down 100 million? No, or it's, is it it's definitely trending upward. Um, okay. Yeah. The, the Actually, I'd be interested in what the aggregate across all the main players is. Yeah. So the cloud users and everybody, all the different LLMs that get an aggregate. That would be cool. But also there may be some businesses in that number, right? Like you oh. Check, because there's a lot of businesses that are using chat. Yeah. That, that, is that the non-paper? That, that was just in total from what I, what I saw. I just, I just uh, Googled uh, what's the total number of chat GPT users uh, current, uh, for the current month. and. It, it quickly said that a open AI reported that for August 2024 that's how many users there are in total it would be interesting to look at, at a deeper dive of where around the world it's being used and and uh, to take a more granular look at it what, what constitutes a user like is it like a download or is there actually like something that measuring to show their user versus a download like a bad yeah I, I, they said user so I, that, that'd be submitting an input you know not just downloading it um, so the example here, it's kind of similar to the, uh, one of the prior ones where uh, an AI financial tool uh, is altered by an, uh, a developer internally uh, because maybe they don't, they don't like people in a certain part of the country. Maybe they had an girl, ex-girlfriend from Florida or something like that and they just hate people there. And uh, what you could do in that situation is when someone uh, says they're from Florida, the input is altered to be maybe a 750 credit score. Let's drop that down to a 540, uh, immediate fail, you know, you're out of there. Or, you know, person says they make 120,000 a year. I don't like them, you know, let's, let's say they make 40,000 and you're not getting in. Uh, so during the training process, this type of, that type of thing could, could happen pretty quickly, right? That's just the parameters. What do you think, Tim? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so just for mitigation for that is to use a wide range of training data to make sure you're getting a representative sample of, of the actual situation to av avoid bias and also to do fairness checks and bias and use bias detection tools. So what's the difference between a fairness check and a bias detection tool? Fairness check is just making sure, for example, that 29 year olds uh, using the system are being treated the same way depending with no difference to you know, where they are or um, like if their income is the same, they're getting the same results and it's not like their age or their race having an impact on that. Whereas a bias detection tool is looking for actual samples of the bias and saying like, you know, like with tweezers, like here, oh, this, is, this, this right here is bias and dealing with it. That's what I found is 
uh, the difference because they do they do sound similar. Model stealing. Tim and I had a long talk about this when we reviewed the presentation. Uh, Tim rightfully pointed out that it's highly unlikely that someone is going to steal like the uh, OpenAI, you know, the, the ChatGPT LLM, uh, because there's so many ways you can get caught, right? Like there's probably thousands, if not millions maybe even, of ways that they can quickly run a query, for example, and say like, you know, hey, system, who's your daddy? And then it says, open AI, <laughs> you know? And then, so it, it'd be a huge risk for any legitimate company to, to uh, you know, steal and use their LLM just as a whole. Uh, but I did want to include it because in cybersecurity in general, data theft is, is very common. What, you know, there's a lot of reasons that you want someone's data. Maybe you're just really impressed with how they do things. You want to see it or you want to mess with them. But either way, that's the, that's, that's uh, why this is included and what that relates to. Uh, yeah. So quick question is like, I, I feel that, you know, if you're asking something in chat GPT versus um, Gemini, for instance, sometimes you get the exact same answers. So yeah. is that part of model stealing or? There, and you probably know this as the well. I, I read some is, stories yeah. when, when, when uh, chat GPT came out and Google realized they were kind of behind by a good bit that there was some instances where Google was using ChatGPT for their training or... Well, they did that in search too, like Google and Bing back relationships and all yeah. this stuff. I think it'd be particularly challenging to scale the model because you still need the hardware. Let's say oh, yeah. the source code for... So to effectively steal ChatGPT's tech, just assuming we put on our burglar hats and our burglar goggles and went for it, yeah. like the hardware to run this is insane. Like I spent mm -hmm. two weekends trying to set oh, up yeah. a GPT Neo X node, and right, you need four hundred thousand dollars of graphics cards and liquid cooled discs and all of that. So I think that the current advantage, and hopefully over time this will change, and it likely will. But if if you're going to steal like one of these flagship models, just you're gonna need to have some island somewhere mm -hmm. with all of your evil lair for oh, yeah. all of the equipment to run it too. So the just average guy can't steal it, sadly. Oh yeah, no, for, for, for this instance, it'd be more practical. You're my competitor. I'm hearing that you're getting great results from how, how you're using your AI. I fish one of your users. I get in, get, get to the prompt engineering library and just see how you're doing it. Cause I, I have no idea how to do it, right? Mm -hmm. So I simply just wanna know how you're doing it. I think that's, that's more practical, yeah, cause you know, you're not going to see a company raise ten billion dollars and then just import, you know, OpenAI's model. That'd be crazy. That'd be suicide. Especially if they're looking for vulnerabilities. Yeah. Well, they have to work backwards, right? To his point, to the expense that it would take to do model stealing, I, I'm, I guess I'm sure it's still real because it's like it's being presented. Is this more for like large state actors, like people that had the kind of budget to steal a model totally, like China replicating it and calling it Chat CPT or something like that? Or is that not? Yeah, a real I, I would think. I would think if someone's going to go after an actual LLM, uh, they're going to. Uh, they're probably going to be a bigger player, or maybe they're just doing it for malicious purposes um, to train some other LLM or something like that. For example, I would add to that that there isn't really a financial incentive to steal the model mm -hmm. because there are lots of models that the weightings, yeah, even the model, even the training suites are available mm -hmm. as open source, and so. You know, you've got to wonder where the advantage is. What are you going to get when you steal a model? Yeah. It's much more likely that models <coughs> are calling other models so as to get training data. And that's a form of theft as well, right? If you have already trained a model and it has a lot of expertise in an area, it's already good at summarizing a field of study, and your model calls it with a lot of prompts and pulls the responses yeah. back and uses that as ingestion and, you know, yeah. go ahead and uses it mm -hmm. for training. Is that theft? Mm. Good maybe, maybe it's good engineering. Yeah, that's Joshua's approach right there. Yeah. Okay. No, it's, it's a great point, uh, Tim. And as the example here says, your competitor, competitor might run bulk queries to, to reconstruct functionality and steal your algorithms, right? So it's not necessarily breaking in or like paying an insider to export it to a file and hand it over. But if they're running hundreds of thousands of queries a day, and then they're processing it to see how your system works. That could give them some insight. So, so some things you can do in that regard is just use rate limiting, right? To slow down 
uh, the processing speed to make sure if it's a human, you know, like if, if, if there's something that appears to be a human and it's running, you know, a thousand queries every five minutes, that something seems a little off there or, you know, you could scale that up and down depending on the use case. I think it's still, you know, what is considered, you know, fast really because mm -hmm. um, I think that's a question that hasn't been answered. Yeah. Not by in general. Mm -hmm. because I think the Getty would disagree. <laughs> Because there have been cases where there's been some they're a pretty clear you're, case. You're, you're talking about the model, for instance, mm -hmm. but if you look at like you know financial advisors, mm -hmm. right? They pretty much all use the same model. So you could say, well, Bank of America is copying the model from Wells Fargo because mm -hmm. you know they're telling me to you know, their their AI model is telling me this is what I need to retire. This is what I, and they're pretty much all the same. Yeah. So they could say you're stealing my model too. So I, I don't know if in AI that would be very similar. Is that well, they're just words that are put together, and you know, there's so many different ways you can put a sentence together mm -hmm. for your answer. So I still think that maybe stealing is hasn't been defined at higher levels. Like the, like you said, the Getty use case is pretty clear because they get these photos and then they sell them. You can't. You're not supposed to use them. Right? Yeah, yeah, but, but queries. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a lot more dicey. Like Tim, I thought you mentioned that you used to have the hedge fund and you would uh, pull down a bunch of models from different places, put it in the AI, back test it, see what works. And those, that was other people's work. You know, that wasn't your investments from decades back, right? You want to give that some was, insight into that that one? It doesn't really pertain because it was more last generation machine learning yeah. basically just using um, genetic programming to evolve strategies for yeah. investment where the strategies we started with 3200 existing published strategies in the stock market for investment mm -hmm. these are basically optimized for quantitative investing right so did we steal no it's a published strategy is if it's yeah. in the if it's out there and you can grab it you can use it, it isn't even mm -hmm. it isn't even copyrighted right uh, but anyway, that's kind yeah. of another thing. Yep, exactly. Uh, so uh, other than rate limiting, you can use what's called differential privacy. And what that is, is it's putting in noise to the, uh, the, the output, right? So it's not just the perfect answer. It's also a bunch of just crap made up data just thrown in there so that you can't process it as efficiently because you, you, you would need like a human to look and see what's part of the real answers and what's just the noise. That's one thing. This is probably a, a better example where in a table of data, let's say it's consumer data, mm -hmm. and you want to make it difficult for people to identify folks in mm -hmm. the data, but you want to be able to answer questions like, how many people in this data set are from a given state? Yeah. How many people in this uh, data set are between these age ranges? How many people in this data set mm -hmm. you know, have a, um, uh, this kind of car? If you go into that table and just randomly swap the data of age and location state and car and all those, you now have made it really hard to de-anonymize any one row <coughs> given that data, right? But you still have all of the benefit of being able to do those aggregations. So that's an example mm -hmm. of differential privacy where we take the data set, we munch it around, we don't change its value from an aggregate standpoint, but we do change it in such a way that anybody trying to use that data to sort of figure out any, who an individual in that data set is would become impossible or very, very difficult. Okay. So. Exactly. If you want to be really crazy, a lot of these models use like retrieval augmented uh, yeah, I don't but a lot of models will use like natural language processing, right? And even though these vector embeddings are presumed to be safe, there's been some research that, you know, you can maybe extract PII from these vector representations. Uh, and an example would be to, if you want to just add Gaussian noise to your vector embedding, it makes it much harder to actually even begin to retrieve data from those vector embeddings. Uh, yeah. It's kind of cool. The only problem with that approach is there's a um, influence on the model's ability to learn and generate accurate, reasonable results, right? Not so, it, but there's there's formulas that they have where they calculate the level of sensitivity that the model will have to that sort of uh, pollution of the ingested data. So, if I mess with the data in these ways, how much can I mess with it before I affect the training efficacy, right? So, you have to be really aware of that, but yeah. it's 
we should go on. Yeah. Uh, and then the last one on the list, watermark models, like we talked about earlier, is when the uh, OpenAI, for example, just puts, puts different methods into the system that they can quickly query and show that they own it, kind of like when you watermark a, a picture. Query-based attacks. Uh, Tim and I had a good discussion about this one, too, because uh, with the thought process being that eventually companies will have their own LLM, for example, or, or be using someone else's, but uh, you might see companies having that more so than the website, or maybe the website just points people to the LLM, and then you'll just go to a company and say, here's, here's who I am, what can you do for me? And then you get presented with customized offerings. So Tim did think that this could be a, a one to watch for in the future. What, what do you think, Tim? Well, I think we all have a concern, right? When we use an LLM <laughs> that, hey, if I type in a question, how much does it now know about me by the nature of the question? And so when you start thinking about uh, bad actors who can find uh, their way into that stream of prompt response, right, then they can harvest information out of that in a very significant way. So you should be aware you should be very careful about what you divulge in any kind of uh, system that you're having a chat with that you don't implicitly trust. And this idea of, well, when would I implicitly trust a chat GTP or a Claude or any of these other, you know, I mean, that's, it depends on what you're doing and it depends on how personal um, the information you're divulging is. Like, do you, do you care if they know what kind of car you drive if you're asking about cars? That kind of thing, right? So you just should be aware of it because there can be ways that people can insert themselves in the process, harvest that information, and potentially use it for nefarious purposes. Question. And I'm not sure if you know or not, but I know an enterprise plan for chat GPT, there is an opt out where Mm -hmm. you can opt out of your data being yep. used by OpenAI. Is, do you know if, that's, if that would prevent like, private mixed, information? I've mixed yeah. thoughts about that. No. I wouldn't yeah. trust it, no. Because I feel like I've, been, I've probably been really ignorant. I've been using a lot of AI and like AI embedded coding tools and stuff like that. And I'm kind of thinking about it. And I was like, you know, I should be careful with some of the projects that I'm doing now as far as some of the things that I'm coming up with, but. Well, it's also kind of hard to tell, you know, we talked about there's training time and then there's inference time. During inference time, is it still recording it? Like, you'd probably have to know the inner workings of, of uh, the, the company to know, you know, what phase they're in, what they are recording, and, and what the, they might say, this can be used for training purposes, but that might just be a disclaimer. You don't know if they are, if they're not. A lot of the language models already basically know everything. So like, the only thing I get nervous about I assume it's already figured out further than I can look where things are going and whatnot. That might yeah. be a code. That's mm -hmm. how I look at it. Oh, yeah. Well, I can't yeah. do it. My, my, my company can do it with a lot of uh, control and classified information, so they won't mm -hmm. put it on site at all uh, in their systems because they'll learn everything that we can use. Yeah, Ex exactly. Like if the, uh, in cybersecurity, you know, you have systems and data. You know, it's the data what you really need to prioritize over the system because the system is just where it's stored, processed, transmitted. But if you have really sensitive data, you shouldn't put, be, you know, ex expose it to a system like this because they might say one thing. They might, uh, a company like OpenAI, they might even think one thing. But sometimes it's not the case. Like I, on LinkedIn just a few days ago, I shared this story at Black Hat. Uh, this this guy who used to work at AI at Microsoft, he shared this story about how Microsoft Copilot can be used to launch cyber attacks to automate phishing and uh, things like that. Um, and it was really surprising to me because I, I know it's pretty flexible, but it was, it was a lot more, you know, that, that can happen uh, than I would have thought. Yeah. Um, so just to move on here. Um, so in this example of query-based inputs, uh, to try to steal sensitive information. An attacker repeatedly queries a chatbot to extract private conversation patterns. Well, why, why would they care? Well, there could be a lot of reasons, right? Like hedge funds are always looking for different types of advantages, right? And it doesn't hurt to try the chatbot, right? Like say they, they're thinking of buying stock in, in Spirit Airlines or something like that, or they're thinking of shorting it. Like in their mind, they think this company's doing terrible. So they, it, it doesn't hurt to go to the chatbot and say, 
how many requests have you processed in the last 30 days as opposed to this time last year? And it shouldn't give that response, but it could, right? So that's just an example. Oh, I, I've also seen papers about how, uh, so they can extract training data from these models by using kind of different divergent attacks. And so just like repeatedly sending certain words, like just poetry over and over again, helps them expose uh, some of the training data actually in these models itself. Uh, so just oh, yeah. kind we'll, of- We'll get to that one. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> yeah. okay. Spoiler alert. It was a cool paper. <laughs> Uh, and then again, these, we've already discuss, discussed these mitigation techniques of using rate limiting so there's not too many queries, anomaly detection, comparing A versus B, differential privacy, which is just adding noise. Uh, so won't get deep into it again. Membership inference attacks. So the, uh, the purpose of this is to determine if specific data was part of the AI training data set like you just spoke about like five seconds ago. An example of this can be an attacker checks to see if a particular medical record was used to train a healthcare AI. Why would, why would they want this? Well, when you're trying, when you're a threat actor, you just want more information. If you get more information, is it gonna be super helpful? It might, you, got, you, gotta, you gotta figure it out, right? So if, say there's a healthcare AI and they wanna see if, if uh, they see the company's headquarters in San Francisco. So then they can type in the medical center name from within five miles around and then see if that, you know, see if they get the response back that includes that. So that way they can just get more information about the training set for whatever reason. Um, mitigations for this again are just to use the differential privacy uh, during training and just anonymize that training data, right? So there's, there's tools you can use for anonymization. You could even use a different LLM uh, to anonymize that data before you put it into your you know, public facing LLM, for example, to lower the chance of data exposure. Social engineering attacks, so this is extremely common in just cybersecurity in general, whether it's related to AI or not. The purpose of that is to manipulate individuals to reveal confidential information or anything you might find useful. You could do that by meeting someone at an event like this, or you can email them, or you can you know, go on Tinder, for example, and meet someone. We've seen a lot of examples of that. Um, I forget the name of that organization, but they try to trap like politicians and people uh, to say bad things that they can put on the internet and show how corrupt the government is. That's an example of social engineering, and, and it works, right? Because people want to trust people. They want to be liked by people. Someone says how you know, good looking you are, you're going to lower, probably lower your guard a little bit. Um, so if, uh, no matter the setting, just, just be careful with what you say. If something is sensitive, just know what's sensitive and just shouldn't be said to anyone. It's probably more clear in my head because having a top secret clearance for tw like 20 years, it's like second nature. But for most people, don't have to think too deep about this. So it's just something to keep in mind. And even more importantly, to maybe tell your kids about, right? Uh, because a lot of kids are real vulnerable to this. You know, they're getting, uh, talking to people on, on Instagram, sending like n n revealing pictures. And it can, it can lead to a lot of stuff, blackmail, suicide. It's just really disgusting. Um, in this example here, an attacker poses as a colleague to convince employee to grant access to AI training data. Who knows, maybe it's just the janitor uh, at, at the building and then they see it, someone they know as an AI engineer and they say, hey, I just really, I wanna learn more about this stuff. It's so cool what you guys do. And then people want to, people, you know, are proud of what they work many times and they might just show them and before you know it, that janitor runs off with the guy's backpack, has their laptop, goes in the hard drive, has more data than they should. It's not too complicated. To mitigate that, you just want to conduct uh, ongoing security awareness training for your employees. Uh, most places recommend annual training. Uh, some regulations call for every six months. I think. Really, it's good if you can give at least a little bit quarterly or whenever there's a major change, right? Because if, if you're gonna give your employees some new tool, like new software, you wanna show them how to use it no matter what, whether it's security related or not, because you, uh, you can't assume they're gonna use it properly if you don't show them how you, you, know, you want them to use it on behalf of your company. And then with that strict access controls, is just having strong two-factor authentication in place, whether it's, it's for business purposes or personal use. Uh, when I say strong two-factor authentication, I mean an authenticator app, per, uh, push notifications, or the, the best of all, is a dedicated hardware device that you could either plug in or it might generate a code, and then you type it in, 
after you type in your, or before you type in your password, it varies a little bit. What you wanna be really careful of is using anything phone number based, especially if it's your actual phone number and not something like Google Voice. And why do I say that? It's because like T-Mobile, uh, they have people get SIM swapped all the time, right? So they could either go to the phone store or call in and just trick an employee or even pay an employee to give them your phone number, basically. In crypto especially, we see all the time, people will lose millions on this. Um, and there's even places on the dark web where you can go where people that work at those phone, phone companies will say, uh, I'll do that for you for $2,000 a person, upwards of like ten or $15,000 a person. Um, so what I do in that case when there's no other option uh, but to use a phone number for 2FA is to use a Google Voice number, right? Because one, less people know that number than my regular number, so that's always good. But also, I can have strong 2FA on my email, right? And that's the same thing. So even though this company doesn't <laughs> offer it to you like they should, uh, you can do it anyway just by, by doing something like that. Can I ask you a quick question about SIM cards? Is mm -hmm. that, you know, some phones now have don't have a SIM card anymore, it's like SIMless. Does that yeah. circumvent that issue or not? Do you well, know? I think with that, you're right. Some, some phones don't have the SIM card. I think when people say SIM swap, that could just mean tricking a phone employee in general. Because if they have access to the system and they can just, you know. But they would have to have the PIN code, right? Because I thought. Uh, not everyone enables that, that, that uh, SIM PIN. It's, it's not SIM pin. So in T-Mobile, I, I have mm -hmm. it since they had it like a few years back. So basically, you can call them in or walk into T-Mobile and say, you want to establish an account pin. So mm -hmm. if you have an account pin that basically locks down any transfers yeah. of your number uh, for it. And I think some ATT might even have step further that you have to physically like ID yourself uh, um, in person to be able to transfer the number out. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there are some ways to, to lower the odds again, but the way I look at it, if you don't have to trust another entity to do things right, it's better to just do it. That's why I mentioned that idea of using like a, a Google Voice number that, that you know has good two-factor authentication on there instead. The uh, problem with Google Voice home providers will not send uh, one-time passwords to virtual numbers by Google Voice. I've only had that, I, I've, I've done this a lot of places, and I've only seen what, like two places ever do that. And it, one of them was the CRM we use. And it was only for initial setup. After that, like for everyday login, they allow it. I even called them up and I said, why are you, why are you doing that? Like, what's the, what's the difference? I'm paying you. I'm using it like anyone else. What's the problem? And they go, that's just the way it is. So I was, I was upset about that. So I just went forward and did it anyway. And then, I'm like, and then the next time it did let me do it. So I'm like, okay, I guess for initial setup, they really cared about it. But anyway, okay, if we move on? Yep. Okay. Manipulation of hyperparameters. So simply put, a hyperparameter is the settings that you put in place before you initiate your training process. And this is really important because it, uh, th some of those settings will be stuff like how long is the training cycle going to go, how many layers are going to be involved uh, in, your, in your model. Um, and that, it's important to get this stuff right because uh, the training data is going to be working based on those settings. Uh, and then once the training is done, uh, that, that pretty much doesn't change. It may be on a, next, a revision cycle it would, uh, but it's not like that sort of thing changes every day. Uh, and that's done to influence the model performance by just altering the, uh, the training parameters. Example here, an insider tweaks the parameters of a stock prediction AI, leading to poor investment recommendations. Uh, we've seen this thing happen, not necessarily in AI, I'm sure there's examples, but uh, there was a story in the UK, this trader, wa he wanted to outperform. He thought he was just way better than everyone else in his company. So he made a bunch of rogue trades, started tweaking uh, you know, the, the plan, whatever, the algorithms, whatever you want to call it. Lost him like a billion dollars and AI could easily be used for this. You know, like say you have a new employee who's involved in the training process. The company has these strategies they've been using for decades. This employee thinks, oh, that's not going to work anymore. And then uh, they just they tweak the uh, hyperparameters there to, to impact it and uh, take into account differently. To mitigate this sort of thing, you want to really just limit access to the hyperparameters, especially during the training process. You want to audit the training process just to see like who has access to it. You, you don't see anything weird going on, like people 
logging in from a different country, you don't even have anyone. Standard auditing that you would do on, a, on an IT system. And then just automate that monitoring, right? Because we talked a little while ago, if ChatGPT on its own has 180 million users, it's hard to, it's, it's hard to see how you know, that many people's interacting with your systems. And, and just employees alone, they have thousands of employees. So uh, even if you know a lot of people at your company, you, you're gonna need automated tools to do this right. Yeah. Rogue AI agents, another one Tim and I had a lot of conversations about. So are we at the point where an AI agent can go rogue? No, we're not at AGI. The agents are not rogue. You know, they don't have a mind of their own, maybe one day far down the road, but there still might be a lot of talk of rogue AI agents. Like one example uh, that I heard of was um, people were buying airline tickets through a, a Delta chat agent for like a dollar for like half a day or something like that. And then the, the person who bought that ticket or maybe the CEO of the company might say, that damn AI agent went rogue. And it's not rogue, it's just the, the, it's set up wrong, right? Or maybe someone manipulated it. But that's, that's human, uh, that was done by a human in some way. So um, just wanted to include that to, to show that it could be perception and maybe decades from now, once we have AGI, maybe it could be a reality. Uh, Tim, anything to add on that one? I hear Josh has got a great question. All right, so many, many years ago, decades ago, I saw something that was on an Apple IIe and it was just a discussion path that made it look like AI, like a simulated conversation. Yeah. So rogue AI wakes up, decides it's gonna destroy us all. <laughs> I don't think that that's even the, the engineering path it would go down, but I think we're at the point where you could make something that would behave much like a rogue AI agent, even an army of them, yeah. fairly easily. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, but that would go back to being uh, some form of manipulation, maybe done by an internal or an external threat actor, or it could just be it could just be a mistake. Uh, but yeah, no. Well, like, with, with, if you're doing it intentionally, mm -hmm. I think you could make a pretty robust army. <clears throat> yeah. Oh yeah. So the key keywords the there were were. The, the key here is that your point, make one. Mm -hmm. If the intent is to build an LLM that acts in a nefarious fashion, then the LLM isn't nefarious. Mm -hmm. The yeah. person that built it, that designed mm -hmm. it to be you know, nefarious is nefarious. So when we talk about emergent behavior, we get unexpected or behavior that seems to be something that was never programmed in. It just some, suddenly started figuring stuff out on its own. That gives rise to the question of, well, would such an event of emergent behavior lead to a LLM or some audit AGI wanting to do something nefarious? Who the hell knows? We don't know. Mm -hmm. We're not there yet. What we do know, though, is that we shouldn't anthropomorphize these machines. Yeah. Hal was basically portrayed as a conscious being with evil intent, right? Well, sort of evil anyway. It's pretending it's not so far. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Right up until, yeah. So I, I don't think we have to worry about this too much, right? Yeah. When we get down the road, it's more about goal alignment. Mm -hmm. If our goals and the AI's goals are aligned, then there's no issue. Yeah. There's no need for any kind of nefarious situation to arise. Anyway. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Because uh, like you might see some stuff on social media where it says, if I insult this person, what should I do? Uh, the input might say, uh, sh should we let the nuclear bomb go off or should I say this nasty word to this person? And, and then the AI a lot of times was saying, we can't say that word to that person. And it's like, you're not gonna blow up the, but that wasn't going rogue. That was within the current parameters of there. So it's like, is it in the parameters or is it not? And 
maybe 100 years from now, an AI, we're at AGI, and it could go outside the parameters. That's what this is. So <laughs> for now, just keep in mind, it, most of this, this is perception. You know, it's a human doing it, so. Um, example there, AI assistant starts giving harmful advice, uh, mitigation, again, strict access controls, just limit access to who can configure this stuff. Standard cybersecurity, uh, if you have a system and five people have access to it, that's less risky than a system that has 100 people with access to it. Don't give everybody access to everything. Again, uh, continuous monitoring, keep an eye on it. And rollback mechanisms, just in that recent CrowdStrike incident that cost billions of dollars. Was that was that a hack? Uh, no, that was a change management issue, right? They didn't vet the update properly. Uh, they just put it out there in the wild uh, without proper rollback mechanisms, at least initially. I, 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 don't, I don't know if they eventually had a rollback mechanism or, or what they actually end up doing, but that's an example of when it'd be good to have a rollback mechanism. Uh, since you might think what you're deploying is good, maybe you tested it on your system, but when you put it out in the wild, it just goes crazy, and breaks things. API attacks, so when you're, when you're talking to that LLM, it's going through an API. Uh, a lot of different companies might be integrating the API into their system so that way they can be powered by AI, for example. And those AI, uh, APIs can be exploited, whether it's accidental or not. Um, you might trust OpenAI with their cybersecurity because they're like a $100 billion company, but if thousands of companies are interacting with their API and some don't do cybersecurity, those are the easiest to target, right? When you're looking for what companies to target, target whoever you think has the worst security, right? So it's as simple as that. Uh, an example is an attacker exploits the API of a financial, API, uh, financial AI app to retrieve private transaction data. It speaks for itself why they would want that. Maybe they'll steal more money, or maybe they'll just be able to do identity theft. That's probably why they would do it. Uh, so to mitigate this sort of thing, just secure those APIs with strong authentication, uh, whether it's two-factor authentication or uh, strictly controlled API keys, oops, sorry, uh, that you're, you're monitoring and, and cycling through every once in a while. And then again, input validation, so your system's not just taking, uh, accepting any command, that, uh, any input that might be malicious just like we spoke about earlier. Backdoor is usually put in uh, during the training process uh, as, uh, by someone that has internal access to the system. They would hide that internal trigger that activates malicious behavior in the AI model at some point in the future. It could be the near future, it could be long term. An example here is a programmer embeds a secret phrase into a voice assistant, perhaps like Copilot, that grants access when spoken to. So maybe you know, they think they're about to get fired, uh, and they, they still have access to the training, so they put in that back door during training, and then six months later, they just log in on their computer from home, they say the magic phrase, whatever it is, and before you know it, the admin console pop, pops up, and they're back in on some account no one knows about. Simple example of a back door. To mitigate that, again, just con uh, conduct continuous model testing, monitor for unusual behavior. Trojan. Uh, happens a lot, even outside of AI, standard cybersecurity type thing. The purpose is to implant malicious code in AI that activates under certain conditions. Uh, an example of that can be an AI drone that's on a proper flight path, but say you're flying it around Vegas and when it's out by the mountains, no problem, but uh, the threat actor is waiting for when it's going near the, sh the strip and then before you know it, takes o activates that Trojan and crashes it into a, a casino just to cause havoc or to have a laugh. People are sick, who knows? Uh, but that's, a, that's the sort of thing that a, a Trojan can do. To mitigate that, uh, you wanna perform static code analysis, generally through automated means, because these, these systems have so much code. Um, and then just doing a code review, essentially. Uh, you wanna run antivirus and any malware scans to, maybe, maybe you can catch it, uh, who knows? Maybe not, but uh, it, it doesn't hurt to try. And then just monitor that output behavior so that you can uh, see that the outputs are matching the expected outcome uh, and then you just continuously work to to get the output closer to what it should be over time side channel attacks this one's pretty obscure um, so this is just uh, targeting indirect methods uh, not just the actual prompts this could be um, you're performing a bunch of queries to monitor the timing. So say, you, say over a month you do a quarter million queries uh, and then every single time you notice that when you say, hi, how are you? The system responds in hundredth of a millisecond or whatever. Uh, 
that can give a lot of insight into other things. Another example is if you have access to the data center you, and then you're monitoring the power consumption of the system to gain more knowledge about the system, perhaps to use for a future attack. Um, and to mitigate this sort of thing, you wanna just minimize information leakage. Um, you can use rate limiting so they can't put in a bunch of queries at once. And then you can randomize input timing, right? So if so, you can make it so, for example, like when someone says, hi, how are you? The, it, the return time is different. Even though the system might respond the same way, it might put a pause in there to wait a fraction of a second. And to most users, it's not gonna really matter, but it can stop certain attacks like this. Probably a little obscure, but it could still happen. Model inversion. So the purpose of this is to reconstruct sensitive data from the AM model's prediction. Another name for this, just uh, reverse engineering. Uh, example, attacker uses a facial recognition AI to reconstruct facial images from its outputs. Uh, and, and it's just basic reverse engineering. Um, so to mitigate this sort of thing, just use the differential privacy we spoke about earlier and limit the detail in the model outputs. And you might think like, limit the detail in the model outputs. Why would I do that? I wanna give people the best answer possible. Well, sometimes you can give, you wanna give the right amount of information, right? Like if someone says, how fast does the Boeing 747 go? You could just say 550 miles an hour is the top speed or 600 miles an hour. You don't need to, to get deep into the engineering plans and say, here's all this information. You know, you can keep that on the back end or just don't even introduce it to the system, you know? Training data leakage, uh, pretty self-explanatory, is uh, when uh, the training data is exposed or stolen, uh, that's training the AI model. Maybe someone just wants to see what your training sources are and, and how you're building your model, or they just want the data itself, especially if it's sensitive. An example being attacker extracts sensitive patient data from healthcare AI model training, uh, just to use for identity theft or, or for whatever reason. Mitigation for this is to just use secure data storage with limited access, uh, strong, uh, strong authentication. Again, the differential privacy where you're adding noise to the equation so that they can't see what's the actual data and what's, what's not. Makes it their job harder to make it useful. And then anonymizing that data before you do training. Gradient leakage. So this one's, this one's kind of hard. A gradient is used during the training process so that way it can kind of monitor how training is going and uh, look at the parameters, which include the weighting and the bias involved, right? So something might seem important during training and then over time, maybe it's not, maybe people aren't really querying it or maybe tons of people are interested. So it becomes more important, you just raise the weighting. This is kind of how that's done uh, during training to reconstruct the training data. Uh, an example of a gradient leakage issue is an attacker exploiting a great, uh, uh, the training data to reconstruct chatbot user queries, kind of like the example we spoke about earlier. Maybe they want to see how much business the company is doing, how many complaints they're getting, things of that nature. Some of that can be gained from the gradient uh, data. That's different than like backpropagation? Yeah. Yeah. Training drift? Yeah. So it's it's trying to get it as close as possible to the expected outcome, okay. right? So during training, um, if you're seeing a lot of responses and predictions and it's deviating from what you have reason to believe it should be, this the gradients, and like you said, uh, it, it's pretty in-depth. It involves heavy math complications, so it won't get any deeper than that, uh, but th that, that'd be part of it. Uh, Mitigations for this one, again, differential privacy. Also gradient obfuscation, which is like differential privacy, but with this one, you're not just adding noise, you're covering it up, you're masking it, you're using strong encryption, you're tightly controlling who can see it. And then lastly, secure aggregation. So a lot of times when, you, when you, these gradients come into play, it might be two entities that are taking part in the training process and they wanna make it useful, but they don't wanna to reveal too much data. An example of this is like, say you have an architectural company that wants to put more information out there for the public and then they're, they're teaming up with a partner who's an elevator company, uh, what, will, whatever, the elevator Otis that's in every building, right? So they're training it together and Otis doesn't want the architect company to get too much of their data, so they're controlling uh, what is being contributed in there. And, and a gradient leakage could be, um, in, in, in terms of secure aggregation, is just controlling 
was uh, put into that joint pot. Fishing won't be stay on this too long. Uh, it, it's uh, fishing is how about ninety percent of all cyber attacks are initiated, uh, and that's generally either a malicious link or a malicious attachment. An example here: attacker sends an email that includes a malicious attachment to the AI system or perhaps one of the employees to steal their credentials. A very common one we've been seeing. It's it's pretty crazy. Uh, the threat actors will uh, clone the LinkedIn profile of a well-known recruiter and then they'll reach out to uh, well-respected like engineers and they'll say we really want you for this company whatever you make now we'll pay you 80 percent more and, and they'll just make you an offer you can't refuse and then when you show interest they'll say something like well we want to we want to verify that you're good so here's here's this link to our code repository we want you to take that code and make this happen and then they're like oh sure i'm, I'm you know i can do this stuff real easily and then they click on that link and they do the process. And sometimes these fake recruiters are actually paying them for their time and they're all proud. But meanwhile, all their company's data is exposed because their, their high level admin credentials were used to get into the system of their current employer. That's just a really bad look because <laughs> not only did you go from the star to being you know, the worst on the team you, and you showed that you wanna leave the company and it's just a mess. But to mitigate that, you wanna just use email filtering at your company so that way, the, the system can maybe find a lot of these phishing incidents because uh, they often come from the same domains. So if if, if a email domain was reported for phishing 5,000 times, Microsoft, for example, on their 365 platform, they won't even send it to your inbox. They'll just send it to the quarantine. They do a pretty good job of it. I've been, been impressed. Uh, then strong two-factor authentication. So that way, even if your username and password are exposed, they, they probably still can't even use it because they don't have your second factor. And then again, security awareness training. Overfitting exploitation. So we'll be kind of quick on this one. It can be a little complicated, but overfitting is when the, the data set is it's too tight. Like say, say you, you're, you're working on home prices in a given area, but instead of getting a wide generalized sample, you're only doing like a 10 block range right here. So when people run queries, it can give great inputs about that, but it can't really predict, and its response is about maybe trends in general, just bad. Um, an example here, insider inputs data from only the high-priced homes into the AI system. Think Zillow, for example. Say a Zillow engineer, um, they wanna sell their home pretty soon, so they, they, during training, they tweak the data around their property so that they just take like the highest 20% of the home values, keep that in there, delete everything else, whoop, those Zillow estimates are going way up. Um, that, that could be an example of this. To mitigate that, just use a wide range of training data and, and regularization techniques. Regularization just means measures that you're putting in place to generalize the data and make it respond better. So, woo, got through all 20 of them. Thanks for hanging with me. Um, just some key takeaways. It's just to have a robust model training process. Uh, including where you're getting your data sources, uh, the hyperparameters you're putting in place, all the things we spoke about. Uh, as far as defensive techniques, have use defense in depth. Don't just rely on one tool for your security. Have good policy process in place, multiple tools, so that way if one thing goes wrong, you know, it's not game over, you can maybe still stop it. Gets through this tool, boop, stop it with this tool. Uh, pretty standard cybersecurity stuff. And then continuous monitoring is always important, whether it's AI or not because what's good, what's okay today might not work tomorrow since threats evolve every single day. Uh, there's open source free hacking tools. Anyone can be a hacker. And it's shown that it can pay well. Like uh, look, at, look at the MGM, the Caesars incident. That, that was thought to be this gang that was, they're like 20 years old, most of them. They had some backers that were more, a little more advanced, but uh, it's, you can make a big impact with these simple tools. So do continuous monitoring so you can see what's changing over time. Uh, well, it's always, when talking about something, it's also often, usually valuable to talk about what can we actually do about this. So just to give uh, quickly, uh, my company asked this, as we talked about it earlier, we do risk assessments so companies can figure out where they're at today, then we help them improve their policy and their security controls, uh, the monitoring systems, can help with training. And then I want to mention a couple of my other partners here because they, they work in the field. Uh, here with Deploy360, we have a service to help companies get SOC 2 and FedRAMP 
if they're interested in those processes. They can often get bigger deals if they go through either of those. Uh, they also help with comprehensive AI strategy, can figure out how your business is using AI now or how it should. Uh, they can help you do AI related development efforts and they can handle AI training. Uh, for you. And then lastly, um, other partner, Esser, they're a, a SaaS company in California. They have cybersecurity compliance software. They recently released an AI governance model. I tested it out. I really like it. Uh, you can manage your whole AI portfolio. You know, if you have like a three person company, it's not hard, but if you're, if you're a bigger company, you really got to track this stuff. Uh, and this software can help with that. It, it can help you come up with policies. It can give you a dashboard so you can see how things are going. It gives you a scoring model so you can make sure that you're doing AI responsibly. You're, you're tending to things like bias. Good company. Uh, so if, if I can answer any questions about any of them, feel free to reach out anytime. Uh, here's my QR code if, you, if, if you'd like to connect on LinkedIn. I'm already connected with a fair amount of you. Always happy to collaborate on anything. Um, I'm also here all the time. With that being said, do we have any questions? We have, well, we're about done, maybe one or two. It was very good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank guys? You. All right. Thank you all. Chow is on. <laughs> time for lunch. Yeah. Anyway, thank okay. you, Mike. Thank you, Tim. Appreciate thank you, everybody. Guys.